Okay. Welcome to episode three of Thermal Birding with Westman's Ringing Group. Today, we are lucky enough to speak to Henry Wynne-Jones, um, which is entitled Thermal Birding with Henry Wynne-Jones. Um, the other person with us today is... Hi, I'm Paul Hopwood. I'm Secretary of West Midlands Ringing Group, um, based in Shropshire. Okay. Henry, thanks for joining us today. Um, I know you've seen a couple of the other episodes, and we're really happy and, and excited to have you here. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing yours, uh, and then we'll look, go into the chat. Okay. Should come up in a minute. That's it. That's one of my favourite photos uh, that you posted on social media. Thank um, you very much. Henry, just just tell us a bit about yourself and the work that you do, uh, if you can. So I'm I'm a birder. I'm a keen birder, and I've been birding most of my life. Um, I went and have spent the last three years in Norwich at UEA uh, University there, and that's where most of my birding has taken place over the last three years. Um, and since then, I've taken six months off or so to just do pure birding before taking a role as a graduate apologist, um, which starts next week. Congratulations. Um, and, and yeah, we've seen quite a bit of work that you've done on social media, which is why I've, we've asked you to, to kind of come and have a chat because some of the work you've been doing is fantastic and some of the photos are phenomenal. Um, but obviously you've also started using thermal tech. So if you can just go into how you used it, what why you came up with it and why you've been using it and how you found it, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I first started using thermals at university. Um, so one of my mates at uni had a thermal specifically for just ringing jack's night. That, that's the, the basis of it. And you know, we, we just, every time we went out birding, we took a thermal as well, just in case there was jack snipe. But then it evolved so that the thermal wasn't just for looking for one particular species it was for everything that was out there it was a you know a, a birding aid and then since then i've purchased my own thermal and used it in all sorts of habitats species places across the country it's yeah it's revolutionized how you bird yeah uh, what kind of what uh, obviously used it with with ringing um and for, well finding jack snipe um, have you got any stories for us around how you've used it and, and kind of any interesting finds you've had and stuff like that? Well, I, I took it to Scilly this year. So the big the big week on Scilly, which I was lucky enough to spend when Scilly was actually producing. Uh, I know a few people didn't have that luck over the autumn. And oh, one particular bird was, it was a, put out as a two-barred greenish warbler. But then it confused everyone over the next few hours whether it was a two-barred greenish or whether it was a yellow browed and nobody could really decide. And it ended up being you know, a mass of people in the street trying to see this bird, which was clearly doing its round, it was doing a feeding loop. And it was high up in this tree and you, you couldn't get on it at all, to be honest. And you only had brief glimpses. Um, and there were quite a few people there that we're all using thermals to pick up the bird. And most of the time you did pick it up straight away. Um, that bird did turn out to be a yellow-browed warbler. But whilst we were there, you know, we went off with the thermal and thermaled other bushes. And if you just look for the, the white spot that you can pick out in the bush. It was really difficult, rainy, dense cover. And we picked out two or three yellow-browds that were just hiding away in the bushes that we maybe would have not seen without the thermal um and with birds like that if they're often moving and you, you can identify them in the thermal as a as a small warbler species rather than a robin for example um i'm not sure you would have been able to do that without a thermal yes you might have found a yellow browed on call but to pick them up straight away in a bush and know its location and be able to track it throughout its whole movement is was fantastic I think for the whole of that trip on Scilly, it was really, really useful. Um, especially even at the Blackburnian warbler, you could you could thermal the gl little globe it was in and and check where it was going to come out. You know, everyone was calling, "Oh, it's here, it's here," and you could you could follow it behind the leaves and 
make sure you're always on it at one point in time. Do you, so, how, oh, sorry, sorry. sorry I, and and so, and it, and it's a really interesting use of it to go out and find these. And for for birders on silly, I suppose it's going to be a real interest in development now over the next few years. But do you find it easy to switch between thermal and finding it in your scope or your bins? Are you, something you're getting used to? Yeah, I think what I found, I found it hard at first. Um, it was something I needed to adjust to. Even just using a thermal in the daytime is something that my eyes needed to adjust to quite a lot. Um, but once you get it set up, it's it's quite easy to use. I think having the contrast right and having a thermal set up properly is very important to being able to find the bird once you've looked it through, uh, looked at the bird through the thermal, because um, you're able to see the environment as well as the white blob, which is what you're looking yeah. for. Um, I think that's what we mainly used it for on Silly was to find passerines in, in trees or scrubland. It worked to treat. It was fantastic. Yeah. I think that's a really good point around kind of learning to use the thermal because I've had a few people contact us where they go, well, we brought the thermal and it's it's not it's not working or it's not finding what we need to find it or not not how we thought it would be. And when you when you talk it through or they come and visit you and you kind of look at the thermal, they just haven't taken the time to set it up right for them. So, you know, with there's especially on the pulsars, there's two focuses. So there's one by the eye and then there's one further out. And then as you said, the contrast and the brightness is really important. And sometimes the colour palette. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what are your findings with, with that type of the colour palettes? What do you I, mean? I do enjoy just using it on white hot most of the time. Um, the color palettes have been interesting to use, but I find that most of the time as a birder, you're looking for the white blob. And once you find that white blob, then you can use your bins to figure out what the white blob is. My favorite's the white as well. Hoppies is black. So I've got I've got another one here, Hoppy. So we're winning at the minute. Um, yeah, so... What what thermal did you so decide to buy, and why did you decide to buy it, and how have you found that? So I started off using a quantum, a pulsar quantum light XQ twenty three V, so a much older model, um, and then the new, which is you know it's a big bulky unit, and then I were gone for an Axion two XQ thirty um, five, which is just fantastic. It's ideal for birders. Mainly due to it, you know, it's, its size and it's a step up from the entry level one, and I think that really made a huge difference. Without without breaking the bank, you still have a thing that is able to find birds that gives you enough flexibility that you're not limited by it, but you've got you've got what you need essentially. I've been extremely happy with it, to be honest. And that's and that's got rechargeable batteries, Henry, as well. There you can oh. interchange the batteries. Yeah, that's brilliant. And oh, frankly, I need to buy another battery because I often find that you know I've accidentally turned it on and left it on in my bag and come to use it and go, oh dear, I, I haven't got any battery life yet. We've I think all, definitely one of the, we've the all been there. We've yeah. all been there. <laughs> there. I, think, no, I know some of the other brands don't have rechargeable batteries. Of, of, you can't switch out the batteries, which I, I find. That's a bit frustrating. Yeah, we've been we've all been there. With like Ben says, it, it's it's a really key point for us that you're out in the field. There are times we'll leave them in our bags and you get there and there's no batteries. But the beauty of those um, little devices and they're only small batteries, aren't they? On the the new Axions that they can just chuck a couple in your pocket. And we're doing the same with our sort of our Helions that we've always got spare batteries because you don't want to get cut short. Yeah. And I think with the I think what you touched on there, I mean, we've used a lot of different thermals and a lot of people ask us why we choose Pulsar over others and, and you hit the nail on the head. I know a lot of the newer Hicks and the Zeiss and stuff are going to come out with interchangeable batteries, but the older ones, we found that we'd get in the field and either it's got half a battery or it run out and then you can't change the battery because it's inbuilt. So and then you can't get it replaced. So it's almost like you're buying a disposable thermal, which we didn't particularly like, to be honest. Um, 
But obviously with your, I mean, the birding aspect is quite interesting because as you've said, you've been able to follow birds through habitat uh, and bits and pieces, but your photography is phenomenal um, and probably was before thermal, but how has that changed things for you? I think the, the main thing it's, it's really pushed for is lack of disturbance. That's definitely the main thing is you know, before, if I wanted to photograph a jack snipe, you'd have to step on it before you were able to photograph it. Whereas now you can see it from a mile off. You can get the biggest lens or scope you can possibly get on a tripod and, and do it from a range rather than you know, put the birds in an uncomfortable position. I, I think it's for some species, it's more than others. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, the thermal helps to reduce that, reduce the distance and lack and disturbance, really. It's a huge benefit of it. Have you found that so anything that the thermal doesn't help you with? What what are the limitations of it for you as a birder? I think sometimes sometimes you can rely a bit too much on it and you end up carrying the thermal the whole time and if you scan a tree with the thermal and you don't see any white blobs, it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a bird there. And if you didn't have the thermal, maybe you'd pick up on it with your eyes, with movement. Um, I think that's definitely one thing to always remember is that a thermal can't see through objects. Yeah. A bird could always be there if it's not in the thermal, not to rely on it. And it is a really important point, Henry, because whilst they're looking at, looking for heat they're they're not infallible so sometimes if you're looking for waders it's not going to see through junkers or bulrush or or plants there so people have to expect that i think if you go out and buy one not everything's going to show up you know it's it they've still got their limitations but like with your photography the these images you know like you say you've got to be you know right on top of these birds usually but you can pick jack snipe up for quite a considerable way, I imagine, now with the thermal. Oh, yeah, a long way off. I think most birds, woodcock's one of them, that you can really, you can do it over 100 metres if there's a woodcock in the woodland yeah. and it's not it's not obscured. It's, it's fantastic. I think I think you've hit on some really key points, really, throughout the, the chat so far. And what keeps popping out is the reduced disturbance. Um, and that's... That's a key message that us as a ringing group keep pushing as well. You know, one one less time in the field because you've got the thermal, we're able to get out for less time. Um, and two, we can just reduce disturbance because there's a recent video we posted with about 60 Skylark in a field. Well, we don't need to go into that field because all it's going to do is disturb those birds and we can actually go around to the next field instead of going through it and disturbing lots of birds roosting um so which is what one of the key things you're saying with your photography and with your birding you don't have to get right in there you can see with the thermal especially the pulsar because it's quite a, you know you can see quite a distance with the pulsar as well oh a long way i think a lot of the time i've really used it at its at its max range to be honest <laughs> yeah. it's, it's difficult but you know, it's, it's interesting um see how far <clears> you can especially like wading birds and things like that. And there's been some, a long way away. And there's been some fascinating sighting or some fascinating um, catches this year with it. I mean, I think Fair Isle, they were somewhere up in the north of Scotland, they had three great snipe, which mm. is, you know, these are birds that are secretive of the best of time, but the thermal's showing what is out there, really, that you probably wouldn't have found unless you were really out there looking all day without it well there's a lot of species which and habitats which are really difficult to bird um yeah. i found recently in norfolk when i was in norfolk there were twite on the shingle and picking a twite up in with the linnet flock in the in the shingle was a nightmare it was really really difficult you just whack the thermal on the shingle and you know they pop out clear as day you can you can see the flock flying around it's it's fantastic have, have you found it has good time in the field down so you're able to see look at some habitat move on and and do that as well or i think so but i i still like to spend the same amount of time 
in a habitat as I would if I didn't have a thermal. I yeah, think yeah. That's the before. You, you do miss things and birds behave in strange ways and you can't predict that. They don't read books, do they? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of just as we were chatting on, on the pre-chat uh, around surveying, so mm. this is quite a big big thing, especially for ecologists now that are looking at using it and more companies are buying them for use of surveys. Um, what are your thoughts around that and how has that helped or will it's, help in the future? It's, it's huge, especially nighttime bird surveys on is it's something you, you couldn't really do before to be honest. It's not it's not easy to do. Um but I mean my personal experience in Norfolk is you figure out how many woodcock, how many skylark are in the fields at night that you wouldn't see before. It opens up a whole new world of surveying and figuring out what's on the land at a different time to what you'd usually be doing. And it's not just birds as well, bats you can the thermals have been used for surveys quite a lot in bats. Um, there's a whole well, range of you can use them for. And, we, and we've always been big advocates of this because <clears throat> a lot of the BTO or the British Trust for Ornithology surveys are reliant on being in the daytime. But when you're moving into the winter months, there's probably 16 hours of darkness in the country. So those birds are somewhere for that amount of time. And I think it's, well, it's our view is that it's just vitally important because we're finding things out in the winter that really would have a huge impact on planning or farm um, land use. Um, you know, whatever that land's been done, that a, a routine non-thermal survey would just completely miss. <laughs> so, in so from what you've so you've touched on birding on the Shetland, where you saw quite a lot of and obviously people, more people are using it now than ever um which is encouraging um mainly for me because we get more accurate data for people and landowners which is what we use it for and obviously moving forward with ecology surveys and stuff like that um have you got any other stories where you've used it for birding and it's kind of been a, a great find or just kind of an interesting thing heaps of stories to be honest i mean i've I've used i've always got it on me now um in in norfolk last week i was at hickling where the cranes come into roost and that night the cranes decided not to come into roost until it was properly dark you know it's still there it's still been a great day lots of hen harriers good birds and then you could hear the cranes coming in but it was too dark to visibly see them and pick them up and you couldn't see that Whack the thermal on the sky and clear as day, 15 cranes were flying over in a thermal. And you could just train your eyes on onto them in the sky, which I don't think you could have done without a thermal. When it's that dark, you, you can't really pick that much up. And the thermal really aided with that. And again, um, you've got an accurate count. An accurate count, exactly. Uh, you wouldn't have had an accurate count before. Um, no. I think <clears throat> that, that's definitely one of the benefits is, is counting birds, not just for surveys, but putting news out for getting an accurate representation of what's in the habitat yeah really i agree but yeah, I was silly we used it to count snipe at porthetic pools before we knew that there was a wilson snipe there but every day we're doing a count making sure that we saw all the snipe and then it just so happens that one of them decided to be good <laughs> we spent less time thermaling and more time looking at the actual snipe mm. We would have found it but i think i think as you've said you can become heavily reliant on it can't you you know we don't we don't leave the house without it really um not obviously go shopping and stuff but just um <laughs> if we go ringing or birding you just seem to pop it <clears throat> pop in your pocket and as you said you're looking around i use it for stone chat monitoring <laughs> so i just scan the the ground for stone chat just so i can get a photo and see whether it's ringed or, co or colour ringed or not, and then it's done, and I'm gone. So it's it, yeah, as you said, it, sometimes you stop looking, don't you? And I think you need to remember, although you've got the thermal, just remember to to look a little bit with your binoculars or your scope, and just spend that time still looking because you never know, do you? No, definitely. But I think so, most people will you know, they'll adapt to that. They'll 
you get used to using a thermal after a while and it, it stays in your pocket a little longer than it would when you first get it. So, because it aids and supports you, doesn't it, for what you do, which exactly. is what it does for us. Um, it's not a hundred percent good in every situation. Yeah, I think a lot of situations rely on you as a birder and your binoculars. Uh, there's a lot of situations where the thermal has not helped. Uh, even though I thought it would help, it yeah. It didn't. Have you got any examples? Yeah, last week uh, in Norfolk. At the Hoons' Warbler. Yeah. It was, I mean, I was there with a few other people and no sign of it. You could hear it calling in a bush. But it was so windy. It was an absolute nightmare. And I thought, you, you know, you, you could pick it up with a thermal. If it was in a bush, you could pick it up quite easily. But over the range it was doing, I'd usually be able to pick up a bird because it was so windy and my eyes were blowing. The thermal just it was not providing any help in actually figuring out where the bird was. No, I think that's a good example because, you know, as I said, thermal is an aid, isn't it, with what you already do. Um, it's not, it's not going to solve every problem you've got, or it just aid you in what in in kind of trying to find stuff, or give you a heat source to actually look at a lot of the time, um, and then put an ID to it. Because um, one of one of my favourite stories, which is what I talk about, is having a birder in a hide at Marsh Lane Nature Reserve. And there was a bittern there, which is quite a rare bird to have there. And I walked into the hide and a bloke was almost in tears because he was like, oh, I've been here for two hours. I haven't seen it. I knew I should have come earlier. The wife kept me shopping and I know I should have should have come earlier and not gone shopping. And he went, oh, I'm just going to go home. And I lifted my thermal up and went, it's just there, mate. And he was like, oh, my God. And he got his bins on it. And he was like, best thing ever, you know. So... It does aid in some situations and makes people very happy by the looks of it as well at times. Definitely. I think bitten's also one of those birds that a thermal really does aid with in certain yeah. situations. I mean, it, once again, a thermal can't see through reeds and you have to adjust your angle to get it right. Yeah. Last week, I was in the Lee Valley with where there's a very showy bit and you, frankly, you don't need a thermal for it most of the time. It's out in the open. But because the hide's so tall, it's above the reeds and you can look down onto the reeds which means the reeds are not in the way of the bittern. You may not pick it up with your binoculars. It was very difficult, but immediately you put the bin, the, the thermal straight on the, on the reeds and just pick out the bittern straight away. And I could track it, whether it was going to come across the channel, run down to the bottom of the hide, run across the channel, go back up. You can follow it a bit more. Fantastic. That's one of the examples of where the thermal really, really did aid, just ease of birding. You, you could view that bitten constantly for about three hours, even if you couldn't see it from the hide with your binoculars. That's great. And and talking about hides, um, I know that a number of people are using the app on their phone so they can, other people can watch in the hide of what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Have you used that or not? Yeah, I, I mainly use it just for replaying. I, I often record videos or take photos of the birds I see quite yeah. a lot of the time actually i find it's it's very interesting especially at night yeah. and having having an app where i can just take the images straight off onto my phone and show people who might not necessarily want to look through the thermal or don't have the thermal at handy it's it's really really good that the app's there and exists <laughs> I'd, I'd be a lot less happy if it didn't exist <laughs> And that's, that's definitely one thing I want to touch on is how good the video recording actually is. It gives a whole new aspect. At, at night, photographing birds is a bit of a nightmare anyway. Yeah, whether you don't, you can't really do it without disturbing them. And then yeah, thermal videoing and photography might might become a thing. Do you, <laughs> you know do I mean? you take them straight off the app, or do you ever take them straight off the device? So like, look, because then most of the devices you can plug USBs in because. Obviously, apps usually, can, yeah, because the apps sometimes can compress them. But um, our view is that when you look through them, the the detail that you get on Stream Vision is still really, really good quality. And the compression, you don't lose a great deal. But when you take them straight off the device, there it's it is just quite spectacular. Yeah, it's really, really good. That's one thing I I didn't figure out straight away when I got my thermal was that I could just plug it in and the images mm. would come off 
And yeah. although the app is very, very good, you know, if you want to have them on your computer and save them like I do, it's Straight if you can get good enough videos. Often it's hard to get videos that are good enough, but ones that show birding behavior at night are really fantastic. I've got some lovely videos of woodcock flying around in a field that when you took your eye away from the thermal, it was just darkness. You mm. wouldn't have seen it without thermal. It, it is cracking. And I think it'd be a really interesting piece of work if um, people took photos or video through the thermal and got an ID and worked mm. up a bank to see whether that was a possibility or not. Because we, we can kind of come with some species just due to the amount of years we've done it and the position they are in the field but sometimes it's quite difficult especially when you see like a little heat source and you think that is a skylight that is and then you get closer and realize vegetation's hidden the whole woodcock and you've just got the tip of its head Um, and then you're a little bit like oh god it's a woodcock not a skylark so it, it can fool you at times that is one of the most difficult things with using a thermal that i found was misidentification of stuff yeah especially I, I live in london now and going out to try and find woodcock on my local patch ends up you know every time i see that white blob in a perfect location in the forest it, it's brilliant like heart rushing woodcock is going to be there and it's a big fat rat just sat you know <laughs> where a woodcock should be it's it's really difficult i found that wasps were one of my hardest confusion species they give off a lot of heat i've i've found very warm wasps to you know what, what's that what's that going through the bushes and it just turned out to be a wasp um but even that we've used a thermal to we were looking for convolvulus hawks and they were flying around somebody's garden and we, we couldn't see them with a torch and didn't want to shine a torch into somebody's garden and you look through a thermal and you could see the hawk moths flying around with the plants because they gave off enough heat which was something i, I never knew before getting a thermal that you could look at moths and insects through them as well to pick them up. We we see a lot of that when we're uh, monitoring nightjar, and we always just see loads and loads of moths through, and and bumblebees and God knows what. So, Beetles, yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting what the thermal allows you to see and pick up, really. Um, and and as people carry on and use it, hopefully, you know, we'll learn more about it, which is what the the main thing is, really. Um. So, no, I mean, I think we've covered quite a large aspect of what you do with it, and I think it's quite encouraging what you're using it for and others are using it for, um, because anything that reduces disturbance, as far as I'm concerned, is a positive. Um, and if people can produce photos like this from a distance using thermal or whatever, then that's a bonus as well, isn't it, for all of us? Um, is there anything you want to add, Hopper? I, I, I just think that the, the photo, it's been staring at me at the screen, is, like Ben said, it is spectacular. But, you know, the chances of coming across a photo that good, and, and I imagine as a good birder, you would, um, Henry, you would see stuff like this. But I'm starting to see more on Twitter of this kind of quality, quality of image, close that looks close up, probably heavily cropped image. But, but they are... Um, just opening a completely different view to spaces um, and what's going on. It's it's really 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 impressive. Do you do you record everything you see through any anything like apps or <clears throat> anything like that? So like um, bird track and stuff like that. Do you use that? No, I use eBird. eBird. So I record the same stuff. Um, the day I saw three jacks night, they go straight into eBird. So the, the positive thing is more people that can keep recording these will protect areas, won't we, as well? Definitely. Um, because I think, we're getting more accurate data than ever. Especially with Woodcock as well, the big yeah. survey that they've got going on at the moment. Having a thermal is so invaluable to finding Woodcock without flushing them yeah. and just realising how many Woodcock are out there. You know, that's, that's a bird if I wanted to see in a year, I'd have to trample through a woodland to, to flush one. Whereas now you can just go to a field at night and there'll be... 10, 15 in a field feeding away. Yeah. And you don't have to disturb them. You can just look at them through the thermal. No, it's, it, it is fantastic. And um, really interested in what you've used it for and um, looking forward to seeing what the future holds, really. 
Do you think it will find anything particularly interesting in the years to come? Do you think it will change our knowledge of what birds are here in the UK? So will we see more great snipe or Wilson snipe? Do you think the thermal will open that up? I think so. I think it's, you know, it's one of those things a thermal can open up finding the birds. It's, you need to get birders to identify them. Um, but I think especially there's there's loads of areas that have habitat for these birds that you know, don't have records of them. I think whether they'll find more rare birds, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> but in terms of actual numbers, it'll definitely definitely increase. I think it's been interesting for species such as skylark uh, mm -hmm. and, and our red red listed species where we're picking up with thermal, you know, really accurate data. So we can start feeding that into the BTO and show a true reflection of what, what how many birds we've got on sites and what farmland's important and, and all that type of stuff. So the future looks good I think so. in I think terms of surveying. One species that is just so under-recorded is long-eared owl. I think that will really jump out when there are more thermals on the market. Yeah, I think there's some Durham guys on Twitter who do a lot of that um the long eared owl work um <clears throat> which has been really interesting as well so in fact think... my my friend from portland was out in the new forest the very first day he took his thermal out and he was scanning across a little bit of clear fell with some um conifers behind scanned across and says oh there's three wood pigeons there so that's what he thought they were couldn't see anything just definitely three wood pigeons they tried to get the binoculars on it couldn't really see and then he lined it up and there were three roosting long ears in the broad daylight but they had no idea what it was and he just thought oh they'll be pigeons but managed to get photos of these three long ears sitting there that they had no idea were there no it's, it, it is good and, yeah. and i think i think the key message throughout has been just reducing that disturbance we're able to see these birds from a distance so we don't we don't need to i mean when i was shown years and years ago to monitor a jack snipe site to count them you, you were told to kind of walk through and count as you went um and now we're able to just monitor that with a thermal camera and, and count quite accurately how many are on that site without flushing any of them um which is quite an interesting development i think um if you have you got anything further to add henry is there any advice or anything you can put out to other birders that are showing an interest because there is a lot of birders now that are really interested in this technology but are just kind of looking at other people that are using it to take that next step really i think really look at the market and get familiar with the actual technology i think you know i, I was one of those people who just thought maybe if i spend 400 quid it will be adequate and it it wasn't <laughs> You do have to spend that bit more to really get a piece of equipment that does the job for birding. It's not like binoculars where you can spend 400 quid and you get a perfectly decent pair of bins that show you the birds exactly how they are. And I think that's one thing I'd say is really do the research and find the right one and learn how to set it up and get used to using it for you. I think that's a key one. Take the time to set it up for mm -hmm. you. Uh, and the way I say that is if you've got a bird feed or anything in the garden, sit there, play with it, get it right, get the focuses right, get the contrast and brightness right, and then the world your oyster, really. Happy? No, I, I just think from a birding point of view, I think you see a lot of people doing um, sort of nocturnal um, recordings, audio recordings, knock mig stuff, but actually we you can sit, you can sit quite nicely in a deck chair with your recording, watching what's going over. So if you hear one red wing looking up with a, you know, with a thermal, there might be 25 there. We've, me and Ben started doing it. We had common scoter in the Midlands just flying over the house. And we just got them on video because you hearing them calling and going over. It's It's got a lot of applications. I definitely think that's one of them, especially for birders. That's a huge thing. And that's another benefit of the recording is, you, you can record it as evidence of something going over. Yeah. And you know, if you can get it right, it does record audio as well, whether it picks up on the bird or not. Yeah. Hit or miss, but 
most of the time it's fantastic for that not making stuff lovely well Brilliant. Henry we really appreciate you coming on and sharing sharing what you do with it and I think a lot of people will be really interested in what you've used it for and we'll take what you've said today out into the field with them and hopefully improve what they do as well and start recording more birds and keep, up with, the, keep up with the keep up with the photography, um, Henry, because the photo is it, it it's it appeared on our um, annual report. It is just a spectacular image. But thanks so much for joining in. That's, oh, one one today, another <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a stonker as well, isn't it? Yeah. So it's no, a really thank... good informative image as well. So yeah. thank you very much, Henry. I really appreciate it. In a pleasure. Thank you both. Oh, do you want to start?